tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Uh, pretty shocked, actually. Uh, but again, at the same time, though, you know it's going to be something that's going to happen. Okanagan outbreak. Health officials identify more locations in Kelowna where people may have been exposed to COVID-19. Also, there is really no other word than tragic to describe what happened inside that Langley home on June 13th. Triple homicide. A 24-year-old man charged in the deaths of his sister, mother, and mother's partner in Langley. And look at all the neighborhoods in Metro Vancouver from Horseshoe Bay in West Vancouver all the way to the township of Langley's Alder Grove. Have you voted? The search for Metro Vancouver's best neighborhood. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. The COVID-19 outbreak in Kelowna is growing tonight. 13 people have now tested positive for the virus. And health officials have identified more sites of potential COVID-19 exposure in the Okanagan City. As Tom Popic reports, they are also revealing how some of the people who've tested positive were likely infected. Pandemic or not, it's the height of the tourist season in the Okanagan. Beaches are busy even on a weekday, but now Kelowna is a COVID hotspot. People, I think, have to show um, good judgment. 13 cases are now connected to Kelowna over the Canada Day holiday week. BC Health Minister Adrian Dick says some of them were traced to private hotel room parties. This isn't to make people's lives uh, uh, less fun. This is about keeping the ones we love safe. At least six of those 13 cases were tourists visiting from the Lower Mainland. Interior Health is singling out partiers at the Boyce Giro Beach Club and the Discovery Bay Resort. Contact tracing is underway. Partiers are urged to self-quarantine for 14 days. There are also concerns over a potential exposure on a July 6th flight from Kelowna to Vancouver. Anyone that visited Kelowna's Cactus Club Cafe from July 3rd to 6th should monitor for any COVID symptoms. Pace Spin Studio was also named. Co-owner Gary Venables opened the gym last fall. Pretty shocked, actually. Uh, but again, at the same time, though, you know it's going to be something that's going to happen. Uh, people uh, do not know when they have it a lot of the times. He's now shutting down and deep cleaning. But other businesses are booming. Critics have raised concerns about Kelowna's tourism push. But Tourism Kelowna isn't apologizing. Well, tourism is an important industry uh, here in Kelowna and around the province. Uh, and of course, we want to move forward safely and responsibly and encourage safe and responsible travel. The main downtown street has been turned into a pedestrian and patio zone, often crowded on weekends. City Council is voting to divert funds earmarked for affordable housing to a new tourism ad campaign. These tourists from Alberta are happy to be out and about again. It's hard not to go see your family and friends, though. Back at the beach, healthcare worker Derek Smith is physical distancing, but says it's up to government to lay down the law. I, I try to go with the guidelines. If, if they're telling us it's okay to have people here, then, you know, I guess we got to work with it. We got to deal with it. Shutting down summer just doesn't seem to be an option here. Tom Popic, CBC News, Kelowna. Meanwhile, across B.C., dozens of new COVID-19 cases have been confirmed since Friday. And there is growing concern about cases connected to a fruit farm in the Okanagan. Our Tanya Fletcher joins us now live with more. So, Tanya, let's start with the latest from the province. How has B.C.'s situation changed since Friday? We are relatively static. We're averaging about 20 or so cases per day over the last three, three days. But let's bring you the specific breakdown of the numbers. So here we are. Take a look. We've had two more deaths since Friday. That brings our total now in BC to 189 fatalities. We've had 62 new cases in total since Friday. That means we have 200 act, 208 active cases at the moment. And right now we have 14 people in the hospital. Five of them are in ICU. So so we have remained relatively consistent compared with the past week or so. But keep in mind, we went after two months of averaging about five to 15 uh, cases at the best of times to now we're seeing an average of 15 to 25 cases. So we are staying relatively gradual, relatively flat, but we are pressing the numbers as they are starting to increase just a little bit. Okay, Tanya, and uh, what more do we know about the cases connected to uh, that Okanagan farm? 
Yeah, that's right. So we do know there are two confirmed cases uh, linked to an Okanagan cherry farm in particular. There's been an outbreak there. So two people have tested positive in connection with the Crazy Cherry Fruit Company. This is in Oliver. It's one migrant worker and one other person who uh, have tested positive. The temporary foreign worker is being quarantined away from the farm in a motel and the other second patient is in self-isolation at home. Now there is an isolation order blanketing the entire farm. It's issued for 36 migrant workers and nine others associated with the farm. None of them under that isolation order can leave the farm while that investigation is underway. The source of the infection is still unknown, but both did contract it in BC. We do know that. Uh, we do know the migrant worker went through the mandatory 14 day quarantine when they arrived in BC as is the province's policy. Uh, and they did test negative after that two week quarantine before they started work in BC. Uh, so the investigation is underway to find out and that will be key is tracing the source of this potential outbreak and as we see there is concern about how widespread it is and how many people on this farm that has big operations throughout the Okanagan and how that will go in the coming days. Leanne, Mike? All right, thank you Tanya. I know you'll be watching that closely for us. Tanya Fletcher reporting live for us tonight. As parts of B.C. continue to welcome tourists from around the province, some Indigenous bands along B.C.'s coast say visitors aren't welcome. The new Chalneth, Heltsuk and Haida nations have all closed or restricted access to their territories and reserves. They say the threat of COVID-19 outweighs any economic impact. Part of the concern, they say, is accessing COVID-19 testing and the difficulty in managing an outbreak. Before these border restrictions can be lifted, the First Nations want the province to commit to contact tracing teams, information sharing, screening and rapid testing. A Langley man has now been arrested and charged in the deaths of his mother, sister, and his mother's common-law partner. The three bodies were discovered after a devastating house fire a month ago. As our Deborah Goble reports, 24-year-old Kia Ibrahimian is facing three counts of second-degree murder. It was one month ago today, June 13th. As flames destroyed this house and Langley, neighbours could only watch on in horror. But after weeks of investigation, homicide investigators are now calling this a murder scene. There is really no other word than tragic to describe what happened inside that Langley home. Tragic because on Friday, 24-year-old Kia Abrahamian was charged with three counts of second-degree murder in the deaths of his mother, sister and mother's common-law partner. All three uh, were the victims of homicide. Now that adult male uh, was identified as 46-year-old Francesco Zangrilli, and the, uh, the bodies of the two females inside the home were identified as, uh, uh, pardon me, 50-year-old uh, Tatiana Bazyar and Medea Befren Ibrahimian, who was 23 years old. Kia Ibrahimian lived in the house with his family at the time of the fire. A neighbor describes how he helped rescue Kia from an upstairs window. I grabbed my landlord and my other roommate and grabbed the ladder and ran it over. There's some guy hanging out of the top store window there and uh, helped him down and I saw they dragged the one fellow out on the side there. A male that um, is exited or managed to um, get out of that home um, is in fact uh, the same male that's, uh, that's been charged. 50-year-old Francesco Zangrilli also managed to get out of the house but died on the lawn as rescuers gave him CPR. At that time, investigators determined Zangrilli was a victim of homicide, but it wasn't until the coming weeks that investigators determined the two females in the home were also victims. I'm not commenting on the cause of death at all or the mechanism of injury or injuries to the bodies. Those are all details that are um, going to be presented before the court. Um, through the judicial process. The accused Kia Ebrahimian's next court appearance will be by video conference on July 20th. Deborah Goebel, CBC News, Vancouver. And homicide investigators say the shooting death of a man at his home in Abbotsford on Friday was likely a targeted hit. Just before 8 p.m., police were called to the home in the 2700 block of Lucerne Crescent for a report that gunshots were fired 43-year-old Karmjeet Sran was hit and later died at the scene. He was known to police. I hit is asking for dash cam footage, 
from anyone who drove the routes you see on your screen there between 7 and 8.30 Friday evening. Anyone with information asked to contact Crime Stoppers. Well, there's another silver lining to the damp and cool weather we've had lately. It's helping BC stay on track to plant about 300 million saplings this year. That's much more than the average of 218 million. Cooler weather allows the planting season to last longer, so workers have been able to make up for lost time because of the pandemic. Of the nearly 5,000 tree planters recruited in BC, none of them have tested positive so far for COVID-19. And this was a day many have been waiting for. Outdoor pools in Vancouver finally open for the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic began. As Eva Yuguen Senj reports, even with new pool restrictions, swimmers were eager to get back in the water. Yes, I've been waiting for a long, long time. <laughs> How often are you going to go now that it's open? Mm, like often. It's fantastic. It's the best day in four months. Two of my favorite days of the year, New Year and like the first day of spring. And then I've, it's a countdown for the, when the pool opens. Vancouver swimmers have been dying for a dip since May. Because of the pandemic, Vancouver has only just opened the Kitsilano, Second Beach and New Brighton outdoor pools this morning. But cooling off in the water isn't as spontaneous as it was pre-COVID. Swimmers have to book themselves a time slot the day before. Yesterday was the first day of registration. I heard that the, um, the system, the online system, crashed in 45 minutes. Or line up and hope there's a drop-in spot available. For sunbathers, pods have been painted on pool decks for up to two people. Change rooms will be closed for the season, so come prepared wearing your swimsuit. Swimmers also have to bring their own kickboards or other equipment. But the parks board says the water is safe. We also got chlorinated water. So the, the water actually kills bugs, kills the virus. So we're lucky in that respect. The park board says the pools will be cleaned after each 90 minute session and extra lifeguards are on deck for emergencies. So they would normally do a rescue as they would normally in a pool if they had to go in. Uh, the difference is they wouldn't do a resuscitation in the pool. They would bring the patient or the victim to the side of the pool and then two other guards would take over, but they would already be ready and kitted up in their PPE to sort of handle that. Outdoor pools have already reopened with similar booking systems in Surrey, Port Moody and Burnaby. Wading pools have also begun to reopen, but with limits on how many swimmers can splash around at the same time. Even all the new rules and restrictions haven't put a damper on pool enthusiasts. It's still really nice. It's a really nice day and I thought I had a really good time. They're just glad that pools are finally open just as summer weather starts kicking off. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. And big props to our meteorologist, Johanna Wagstaff. Excellent timing with that <laughs> sunshine today on the opening of pool day. And I heard you were down at New Brighton this morning, hey? I couldn't get a pool slot. I probably contributed to the uh, crash of the website, but I'm going to try <laughs> later on this week. But I got to see the first swimmers uh, during my uh, dog walk this morning, and man, it looked good. I've got to admit, even after the first shift was done and I saw the cleaners come out and wipe down all the railings and the second swimmers, I was envious. I mean, this is swimming weather, and we've been waiting a long time for it, so uh, probably worth the online wait beautiful blue skies built in yesterday thanks to this big high pressure ridge just a few dancing cumulus on the north shore right now a few morning cirrus blue skies other than that and almost seasonal temperatures let me show you what it looks like uh, as far as temperatures go across the south coast hot spot in the province of course port alberni at 24 we're at a 19 and through yvr a little warmer downtown i'd say about a couple of degrees uh, speaking of the big warmth though in the u.s All right. Well, we uh, have lost contact with uh, Johanna for the uh, time. I think I'm back. Oh, yep. climb in for the He's next back. couple of days. <laughs> uh, warm temperatures for us will. Bu All right. Well, we are having some uh, connection issues with uh, with Joe, but uh, we got the gist, and we'll expect more later once we get our technical stuff uh, sorted out. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, it's July 13th, so the Vancouver Canucks have begun training camp for the second time this season. Put on hold in March because of COVID-19, season has officially resumed as part of the NHL's return to play program. 34 players reported to Rogers Arena today for practice. Players who spoke with us say they are excited to be returning to the ice. It's nice to be able to go home and now uh, you know, skate, skate a full team practice and uh, uh, you know, it's nice to get going here. Uh, Get ready for for uh, what's going to happen in a, in a couple weeks here. Okay. Um, you know, having no fans, uh, I think that I mean, from just talking to guys that have played in the playoffs, I know that's uh, a huge thing in the playoffs. So um, it's going to be a little different, but um, you know, it's exciting. The Canucks will have one exhibition game before they take on the Minnesota Wild in a playoff qualifier. That best of five game series with the Wild starts August second in Edmonton. And 23 other NHL teams opened their training camps today. Players will soon be heading to either Toronto or Edmonton for the playoffs. As Rafi Buchkanian explains, that could be a nice boost for the Alberta capital. Nobody will be facing off at Rogers Place until August 1st. That's when the new playoff season begins. But training camps are underway right now from Edmonton all the way to Montreal. And it's not just hockey players getting ready. It'll be a nice injection for sure. I think one of the unique things is, is that um, we really feel that because so many games are going to be played over such a short duration, um, especially the playdown rounds, that there, there, we could see a number of multiple fans coming. It could be a Oilers fan if the game's early in the day, and by the end of the day, maybe they're an Avalanche fans. This sports economist says that economic boost will be more symbolic than anything else for Edmonton. I don't think you can really look at this as, a, as an economic opportunity. I think obviously having people in the city spending money is good for the city overall, but the, the number of people that will be here and the time period that it's going to be covering is really not going to make much of a dent in the economy. So I think that we need to look at it more from a, as an opportunity for the city to showcase itself and for uh, citizens to feel good about the fact that they've handled the, the pandemic very well and have been able to uh, present themselves as a, as a city that's safe for players to play in. And there are still lingering health concerns. Several hockey players across different teams have already opted out, citing health and safety. The NHL and Ontario and Alberta's public health departments say they've drawn up as good a plan as they can to keep players and staff COVID-free. Rafi Bajikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. And there is still some time left if you want to make your voice heard as Simon Fraser University reviews the use of Clan as its team name. You can visit the change.org petition to leave your feedback on the name. Clan was originally chosen to honor Simon Fraser's Scottish heritage, but those in favor of a change feel it can still be done without using a word that provokes images of the white supremacist Ku Klux Klan. The petition is a chance to name the petition is currently at nearly 10,000 signatures. And speaking of name changes, after decades of complaints about racism by indigenous groups and others, Washington, D.C.'s NFL team says it's dropping its name and logo. While it's possible the owner was finally persuaded by arguments those are racist, as Cameron McIntosh reports, there may be another explanation. That name, that logo, 87 years of tradition are wrapped up in them. So are decades of turmoil. Viewed by many as a racial slur, the faithful are coming to grips with the team's announcement. I'm not feeling the change, really, honestly. I'll be honest with you, it is time for a change. It's family. That's all it is. The race kid is a family. For years, there's been an Indigenous-led push to change the name. Support grew. This was star football analyst Bob Casas in 2013. It's an insult, a slur. Team owner Dan Snyder has always refused. So, what's changed? Sponsors. As recent anti-racism demonstrations sweep the U.S., FedEx threatened to pull its name from the team's stadium, taking tens of millions of dollars of sponsorship dollars with it. It's once the sponsors started saying, all right, it's either you stick to that name or you stick with us. Uh, that he decided to change. It, it's as simple as that. It's always going to be what it is. It, it's money drives the story. Today's announcement, which went out on team letterhead with the logo, made direct mention of sponsors before fans. Twice. And some question if this is really progress. 
when you have a team named after a dictionary-defined racial slur, that should not take the kind of corporate pressure that's been, been brought to bear here. I truly think that if there was some real social consciousness raising with the, the corporate sponsors or with the, um, the team owners, we would see them doing more than just changing the name. Similar corporate pressure has the CFL's Edmonton Eskimos and baseball's Cleveland Indians looking at their names. But the Atlanta Braves say they won't change theirs, though they are reviewing the tomahawk chop. Meanwhile, in Washington, a new debate. What should the team be called? Warriors is a leading candidate. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Big debate going on. Yeah. yeah. A reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. Both of us and Johanna are also on Instagram and Twitter. Now, speaking of what you can watch online, video of a rescue at a BC lake is going viral. Right, you just... It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You just stop, saved, stop, 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 you stop. saved an eagle out of the lake. This, is this Calgary man was enjoying some vacation time with his wife at Windermere Lake when they spotted a baby eagle. They ended up having to pull it onto the boat twice before they took it onto dry land. At the time, he wishes his wife had uh, helped him save off those sharp <laughs> talons. No kidding, but now he's glad she managed to get it all on film. That, I like you. That's amazing. You that's okay? amazing. I like that she was trying to narrate through the whole thing. She's like. <laughs> She's like, are you aware of what you're doing? You are saving a baby eagle. <laughs> Think about this. This happened, uh, there's some powerful symbolism going on here. This happened on July 4th, which of oh. course is the 4th of July mm -hmm. in the States. Uh, the eagle, a powerful American symbol, and there's a Canadian dude doing his part. That's wild. That is wild, that's very cool. Good for them. Well, he says he made a mistake. The Prime Minister apologizes for not recusing himself from We Charity contract discussions. We'll have a reaction next. Thank you for tuning in to our commercial free live stream tonight. Well, church, mosque, museum, the historic Hagia Sophia has seen it all. Yeah, a symbol of secular Turkey, it attracts millions of visitors every year. And now, as Rene Filipponi tells us, it's going back to being a mosque, and that's causing a religious and political divide. The Hagia Sophia holds the story of Turkey's past. Founded in the 6th century as a cathedral, it was converted to a mosque in the 15th century and a museum in the 20th. Today, the court ruled it should be a mosque again. We have been waiting for this news for a long time, says this woman. She has plans to pray as soon as possible. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan says it will open for prayers in two weeks. He sees the change as an opportunity for Turkey to exercise its sovereign rights. But it's a controversial one that hits at the heart of the country's religious secular divide. It's not just an incredible place of worship, but it has images of Jesus Christ and Mary and names of Allah and Prophet Muhammad written in Arabic all in the same space. This Turkish journalist and writer worries about the message it sends to the Christian minority, calling it a political move by a populist leader. It's not an accident that he's doing this right at the time that his support is going down to some extent because of the discontent in Turkey, a bad economy, a lot of uh, complaints with corruption and authoritarianism. There are a few new parties that actually appeal to the religious voters that uh, are challenging Erdogan. The move has been condemned by the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church and by neighboring countries like Greece. Even Erdogan's ally, Russia, says it's a mistake. He's going to play that up as saying, you know, I'm still a strong leader. I don't care what the international community says. I'm standing up to you know, foreign powers. The government says Hagia Sophia will still welcome tourists and Christians. But UNESCO calls Turkey's decision regrettable and says it will be reviewing its status as a World Heritage Site. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. And in California, a grim discovery today in the search for a missing Glee actress. A body has been found at Lake Piru, north of Los Angeles. That's where Naya Rivera went missing five days ago after taking her son out on a rented boat. The four-year-old was found alone and safe on the boat. 
He told authorities his mother ne never got back on board after a swim. The body has not yet been identified. The 33-year-old played a singing cheerleader for six seasons on the Fox musical comedy hit Glee. Very sad. Very sad. Big talent. I know lots mm -hmm. and lots of people are very sad about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, stay with us. Uh, just a couple of seconds. We're going to have the latest on the We Charity scandal that's been plaguing the Prime Minister. And we'll also have more on the manhunt for a father whose missing daughters were found dead. I'm CBC journalist Will Fundal, and I'm non-binary. But what exactly does that mean? We'll answer some of the gender questions you always wanted to ask in our new podcast, They and Us. Listen now. The Prime Minister is apologizing for his handling of a multi-million dollar government contract given to a charity his family has close ties to. For weeks, he's been defending the choice of the WE charity to administer a government program. Today, a major shift. Justin Trudeau now says it was a mistake for him to have been involved in those discussions at all. Trudeau has appeared at WE events. And his mother and brother were paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for speaking engagements. As David Cochran explains, not knowing that number is one of the regrets the Prime Minister expressed today. The Prime Minister insists his government was trying to do the right thing, but admits they did it the wrong way. I made a mistake in not recusing myself immediately from the discussions, given uh, our family's history. And I'm sincerely sorry about not having done that. In essence, saying it's not we, it's me that caused the collapse of the student grants program. Oh, I am uh, sorry because... For many things beyond the program be right itself, for dragging his family into a controversy. What I also deeply regret uh, is the fact that I have uh, brought my mother into this situation uh, in a way that uh, uh, you know, is uh, really unfair to her. Sorry for not knowing how much his family was paid and plunging his government into a third ethics investigation. I did not know the details, and as I said, I should have known the details, uh, and I regret that. We know that Justin Trudeau is uh, only sorry when he gets caught, and, and that's what the apology was all about today. The Conservatives still want the police and Parliament to dig into this. The Bloc says Trudeau should step aside while the Ethics Commissioner investigates. He always does it again and again and again. And there comes a time when we do not trust him anymore. An apology as well from the finance minister, who also didn't recuse himself, even though his daughter works for WE. And while the WE organization is no longer running the student grants program, it is running ads, saying the charity only did what the government asked and was never going to profit from this, just recover its costs. All of this has left the Liberals damaged and the government scrambling to start up and deliver a student grants program it argued it didn't have the capacity to deliver, which is why all of this went to WE in the first place. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Using a helicopter, drones and sniffer dogs, Quebec police and the Canadian military spent the day searching a wooded area near Quebec City for a missing father. As Justin Hayward reports, the 44-year-old man was last seen with his daughters before they were both found dead on Saturday. At a makeshift memorial to her two daughters, Emily Lemure tries to speak about the unimaginable. Dès le premier souffle. <laughs> 11-year-old Nora and Romy, six, were found dead in the forest on Saturday after last being seen with their father. Police have been searching for Martin Carpentier since Wednesday when an Amber Alert went out. With dogs and drones, they've combed the thick forest, so far finding only what they're calling objects that lead them to believe he is nearby. He is a person that may be suffered from, from some injuries. He is implied in a criminal investigation. We have two little girls that has been, has been found dead. And also 
He is the clue of all of this event, all of this situation. Carpentier was a scout leader, his daughter's scouts. People who know him say they can't believe this is happening. They say he lived for his daughters, seemed happy. But some also point out he was in the middle of a difficult divorce. All our hearts are with the mom. Uh, a mom has been, her life has been shattered uh, forever. Experts say sometimes the danger signs get missed. We can never minimize um, a parental abduction. You know, there's um, this myth in our society where we think that because children are with the other parent that, that they are safe, and that's not necessarily the case. People who live nearby just want it to end. I'm afraid, she says. What if he has a gun? We're keeping our children close, he says, and the door's locked. It's not normal for a quiet area like this. Police are hoping to find Carpentier alive, but after 72 hours in the bush, the chances are getting slim. Justin Hayward, CBC News, Montreal. In Ottawa, a guard will once again be stationed at the National War Memorial and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It was stopped because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The sentries return this morning and will remain until November, but on a reduced schedule. The program was developed to honor those who have served and to help protect the two historic sites. Well, in a typical year, Canada takes in tens of thousands of refugees, but COVID-19 has forced the resettlement process for many to stop. For at least two women in Newfoundland, that's meant additional months and perhaps longer separated from their loved ones. The CBC's Adam Walsh with their story. Natsunet Haley Michael and her daughter Sabrine are waiting for a family reunion. Haley Michael's husband, Sabrine's father, is stuck in Sweden trying to get here. But two flights have been cancelled because of the pandemic, and come late August, his entry visa will expire. Uh, hopefully it's stress, uh, but just I'm waiting for him. The Haley Michael family fled Eritrea, a country on the Horn of Africa. In 2016, the United Nations accused the regime there of crimes against humanity. It's meant tens of thousands have fled the country over the years, many to refugee camps in neighboring Ethiopia, which is where Terhas Debse's family awaits. Debse works 130 hours a week in order to bring them over. She's afraid the pandemic will mean significant delays in the process. Refugee arrivals are down significantly, says the Association for New Canadians. Last year, for example, we were probably close to 150 by the end of June, whereas this year we have under 40 arrivals. So that's, you know, that, that's a very big change. For now, it means more waiting and hoping for a reunion. Plans are already in place for when that happens. After that, I would bring a new baby. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> In my country, they are not allowed to free worshiping with my. I didn't get to worship God a uh, chance. So when they came to Canada, we are free this time. So we're gonna worship to our God. <laughs> As for when things will get back on track, the federal government says refugee resettlement will only fully resume once conditions allow, and that depends on the pandemic. In the meantime, requests for protection will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Adam Walsh, CBC News, St. John's. The World Health Organization is warning too many countries are headed in the wrong direction on COVID-19. Coming up, the latest numbers from the U.S. and the conflicting messaging from Washington. with Peter Mansbridge. Good evening. More than 500 fires are blackening the forests of British Columbia tonight. It's the province hit hardest by a combination of hot weather and tinder dry trees. Nowhere is the danger as great as in the southeast corner of the province. Firefighters are out by the hundreds, and now people in a town where the fire is closing in are refusing to leave. Catherine Wright reports. It's another dry, hot day in the East Kootenays, 31 degrees. The fires and the smoke just keep spreading. 
far too close to the town of Canal Flats. As far as forestry officials are concerned, they want everybody out. Yesterday, about 500 people left voluntarily. Today, there's another 150 who will be asked to leave. Uh, most of those, I think, will go. There will be a few diehards, and there is some provisions under the Fire Services Act of British Columbia to uh, remove them. Force may turn out to be necessary because even as smoke billows behind them, there are some people in Canal Flats who just won't go. What the hell? I'm going to chain myself by my house, and I'm going to stay right beside it when I was there for 18 years. That's where I'm going to stay. It's on both sides of this lake that the evacuation is being carried out. It doesn't look like there's any immediate danger, but beyond these hills, the underbrush is smoldering, and the concern is that hot weather and high winds could cause an explosion. Well, if the winds come up or there's a drop in humidity, uh, fires, past history has shown that they can, you know, within a few minutes consume a, quite, a few, quite a large area, and that's meaning consuming the oxygen. It's not the fire that's going to kill people, it's going to be the smoke and lack of oxygen. They feel that the potential here is very great of all five fires joining force very rapidly and forming a fireball that something that none of you I believe will ever see or probably ever have seen. This afternoon, the local fire commissioner met with people in Canal Flats to try to persuade them to get out. I can be out of here in five minutes. On top of that, I've never been convicted of a crime. If protecting my own property is a crime, so be it. I'll goddamn well go. What jail is big enough to hold everybody here? We've lived all our lives here. This is all we have. Me, as well as everybody else, is not prepared to lose that. As tempers flared, firefighters did what they could to try to prevent more fires from flaring up. Several fires are still out of control. On a scale of 1 to 100, the danger level set for this town is 93. Police say they will forcibly remove people from their homes if it's necessary. Catherine Wright, CBC News, in Canal Flats, British Columbia. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Tourism is an important industry uh, here in Kelowna and around the province. Uh, and of course, we want to move forward safely and responsibly. Tourism officials in Kelowna are pressing on as health authorities identify two more locations where people may have been exposed to COVID-19 earlier this month. Yesterday, Interior Health said anyone who visited several businesses should monitor themselves and if they develop any symptoms, get tested. And two more people have died from COVID-19 in B.C. since Friday as the province logged another 62 new cases. That's over the last three days. There are currently 208 people with active cases of the virus. 14 are in hospital, five in intensive care. That brings the total number of active cases, as mentioned, to 208. 24-year-old male by the name of Kia Ibrahimian was charged with three counts of second-degree murder, one count each for each of the lives taken at that home. A young man has been charged in connection with the deaths of his sister, mother, and mother's common-law partner after what police described as a triple homicide that ended in a Langley house fire. Kia Ibrahimian has been charged with three counts of second-degree murder. Ontario is set to lift some restrictions put in place during the pandemic. People will be allowed to dine indoors, go to the movies and visit the gym as of Friday. But the Toronto region and other hotspots together accounting for more than two thirds of that province's population aren't included. Jacqueline Hansen shows us how that's playing out. In Toronto, a trip to the playground is still just sightseeing. I really want it to go back to normal. Kids in the Toronto area, Hamilton, Niagara and Windsor, Essex have to wait. Stage three of reopening isn't happening here yet. Nobody happy. Elsewhere in the province, the next phase starts Friday. Playgrounds, gyms and movie theaters can reopen and restaurants can serve indoors. Just because we're going to stage three doesn't mean we have to let our guard down. While we are 
opening up some things, we're still asking the public to be uh, diligent. Groups can get larger with physical distancing, but there are still limits. 100 people outdoors and 50 indoors. Landmark Cinema says that won't work. At its Calgary theater, it's allowed 100 people per auditorium. As a multi-screen, multiplex conventional theater operator, we can't open with just 50 people. There are just no economics or operational procedures to open for 50 people. Ontario's premier agrees. This doesn't make sense. We have, uh, you know, cinemas that have 12, 15 different theaters. A company can make its case to the chief medical officer for an exception, and Landmark intends to. But businesses in Toronto will likely just have to wait. The area was two weeks behind for the start of stage two as well. For this downtown gym, its outdoor classes aren't sustainable much longer. We only get five or six people because we don't have the space outside. Moving back indoors would be a game changer. It would help us make rent, it would help us be able to pay our coaches again. A return to something closer to normal that many across the province are craving. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. While the Prime Minister today addressed other topics besides the WE controversy, he said his government is extending a program that helps businesses cover 75% of workers' wages. This week, we'll be announcing an extension to the wage subsidy program until December to give greater certainty and support to businesses as we restart the economy. The government boosted the budget of that program last week to more than $82 billion. $18 billion has already been paid out in payroll support to more than 250,000 businesses. Well, school districts across the country are trying to work out how to get students back in class this fall, but one university in Nova Scotia says it's going to make students sign a COVID-19 liability waiver in order to attend. The CBC's Brett Ruskin has more on how that school is reducing its risk. Well, with the new September school year just around the corner, universities are taking all kinds of steps to try to keep their students and faculty members safe. And many universities are opting for online virtual classes. But at St. Francis Xavier University, they are taking a slightly different step. They're having a mix of virtual classes as well as in-person classes. And those students who are coming to those in-person classes before they arrive on campus, they have to sign a liability waiver. Now, this waiver basically absolves the university of any responsibility if those students contract COVID-19 and have any loss, damage, illness, or even death. And so this is something that the university is requiring the uh, students to sign. On, on their end, though, on the university side, they are taking major steps to try to keep students safe. They are uh, ramping up their cleaning protocols. They are also ensuring that uh, the number of people in public spaces are reduced, so that people can stay physically distanced. Also, uh, mandatory masks in classes. So it'll be interesting to see what the response is come September, but there's already been some pushback from certain students talking about uh, a petition that's already online asking for the administration to revoke and retract this requirement for this liability waiver to be signed. Uh, and speaking with legal experts, they say that these types of waivers are not necessarily always airtight and there could be litigation that comes from any possible uh, uh, illness that could be contracted uh, as a result of uh, negligence on behalf of a party like an institution. And this isn't the first time that we've seen this. For example, here in Halifax, uh, there's a similar similar liability form that parents have to sign if they want to put their kids in summer camps. So it'll be interesting to see if this has an impact on enrollment come September or if this is just the one of the first universities of many that will uh, adopt this practice of requiring liability waivers like these to be signed before students hit the campus. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. The day after a global record was set for highest number of daily new COVID-19 cases, the World Health Organization warned too many countries are headed in the wrong direction. And the U.S. still outnumbers every other country by far, with more than 3.3 million infections. Katie Simpson has more on the conflicting communication from Washington. After a morning of biking, Steve Keen and his sons try to physically distance as they stop for a treat. While taking precautions, Keen says he's not worried about exposure to COVID. I think the, the hype about this coronavirus is really over the top. Uh, we, we don't focus on it, we just practice good hygiene, keep distance, and we go on with our daily lives. 
Jimmy Torres and his family are embracing a similar attitude during their DC vacation. No one is concerned about the case spike back home in Florida. I just think it had more testing abilities because uh, there really wasn't any that uh, was available in the beginning. The claim that positive cases are the result of expanded testing has been debunked by scientists, but Americans keep hearing it from the president. We test more than anybody by far, and when you test, you create cases. Not only is Donald Trump accused of ignoring evidence, he's ramping up criticism of the scientific community, sharing this tweet by former Love Connection host Chuck Woolery. The most outrageous lies are the ones about COVID-19, it says. Everyone is lying. The CDC, media, Democrats, and our doctors. We need to be led by public health science because it's the only way to get our economy back and running. It's the only way to, to save lives. The White House is now denying it's trying to discredit a member of its coronavirus task force after distributing a list of all the times Dr. Anthony Fauci has been wrong about COVID, Comments that were made as the science was evolving. I find him to be a very nice person. I don't always agree with him. Fauci ignored the jabs, urging Americans to better protect themselves. That's a difficult message when people don't take something seriously, but we've got to hammer that home. Mixed messaging has been a challenge in the U.S. and is one of the reasons why some Americans are skeptical about the seriousness of the situation. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. 6.45 Monday night, there's a live look at uh, BC Place Stadium, blue skies this evening. So here's the question, is the sun going to stick around for the rest of the week? Well, we're going to find out next from Johanna. Hi, I'm Sarah Jean Bourget. And I'm Mark Johnson, and we're both visual artists living in Vancouver, BC. As a couple, we've been practicing social distancing since March 15th. The biggest change to our practice was to both lose our studio. Um, for me personally, I had to shift my drawing practice to focus more on printmaking. Mark is a natural printmaker, so for him it was just about scaling down the work. Uh, and then we started collaborating together using our little uh, press at home. Yeah, we converted our patio into a printmaking studio, which we're calling Patio Press. And we're both super excited about all the future projects that are coming out of it. Over here we have a table for cutting and trimming paper, as well as a slab of granite for mixing and rolling out ink. Different tools for cutting and applying pressure and applying ink to print and a shelving system with different inks to print with, uh, glues, brushes, as well as a beautiful hand-printed sign by our neighbor and printmaker Robin Gleason, and the most important tool of the patio, the press. And in terms of the uh, prints we're making, the images we're making, uh, they're not necessarily a response to COVID-19, but I think subconsciously we've been making prints that kind of speak to it. Like we've been printing nets, we've been making chains, with, which kind of speak maybe to this idea of being at home, being stuck at home right now. We're very privileged, we're very lucky to be able to have a press at home, uh, to have a community that's caring enough to uh, give us positive reinforcement and willing to participate in a time of isolation. Uh, art is really important right now because it's giving us a direct avenue to the outside world. 
even when we're all trapped inside. When your backyard is burning, is anywhere safe? I'm Adrian Lamb, the host of a new podcast, World on Fire. Join us on the front lines of wildfires burning around the world. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Well, here on the West Coast, we're used to winds that stir up white cap conditions. Yes, and then there are other winds that turn the water into a snow-like foam. Yeah, bad weather in parts of South Africa's southwest coast left the ground and vehicles spattered with the stuff. Meteorologists warned of an intense cold front with gale force winds up to 100 kilometers per hour. Uh, those are the wrong pictures, but uh, those uh, are the conditions that uh, exist when one is trying to create snow foam or have <laughs> snow foam created. Trying to get the height. Not quite the sight in and around Red Deer, Alberta. Heavy hail covering the highways, making a summer day look more like a winter wonderland there. And that was just some of the severe weather that hit Alberta today. A possible tornado was also spotted further south near the town of Nanton. Wow. Exciting weather happening over there. Johanna is back with us. Uh, they, they got a lot going on next door in Alberta. Hail and tornadoes, nothing like that here. A breeze, we have a breeze. No, we are on the uh, right, a breeze, yeah. We're on the right side of the Rockies, I'll say. Just a, a gentle breeze and high pressure. That low pressure system, funny enough, that brought all of the severe weather to the prairies today was the one in BC uh, that kicked out on Saturday. So it's moved over the Rockies and it'll continue to track east across the country. And we are left with this high pressure ridge. Let me show you what else that ridge is doing. I'm going to take you to the systems map. Uh, as It's not only giving us the sunshine and seasonal temperatures, but it's protecting us from any approaching system. So you can see that low pressure system off towards the northwest. Uh, that's bringing rain to central and northern coastal sections. But that high pressure is protecting us from any system moving in. And it is going to be the name of the game for the next couple of days. Uh, we do have some showers for, uh, again, the midweek forecast. As I take you through, there's that low, bringing the showers to the north, uh, tracking across to the interior, but high pressure holding strong. It's Thursday, it starts to kick off, and we get those showers finally uh, sinking down across the south. Really just a one-day wonder for rain. Uh, looks like we get back into the sunshine, and I'll show you that long range in just a moment. Tonight down to a 14, and then back up to the 20s tomorrow. You can see in the interior, Finally hitting the seasonal mark for places like Kelowna and Kamloops, Osoyoos looking to get into the low 30s for tomorrow. And then that forecast as we head into Wednesday, even hotter at a 32. I imagine around Wednesday we'll start to see fire risk creep up. Right now very low across the province because of our cool and wet spring and start to summer. Same story in the north, although that northwest uh, will continue to get the rain and cooler temperatures. But Peace Region... Some good seasonal temperatures for you in the forecast uh, for the next couple of days. Our long range, as I mentioned, looking pretty good. We've got those warm temperatures uh, to continue right through to Thursday. Little blip with that rain, rainy system and then back up to uh, low 20s for Friday and Saturday. Look at that 23 on Wednesday, though. More like a 28 for the valley and there will be a little bit of a humid X, uh, particularly if you're watching from the east side of the island. That's where we could be uh, approaching the uh, high 20s as well. And I was looking at the long, long range. Can't help it. It's summer. We deserve some uh, summer weather. <laughs> and it does look like that second ridge does last through to next weekend. So no promises on your Saturday yet but uh, looking pretty good pretty good indeed all right thank you so much Joe well Metro Vancouver has many diverse neighborhoods but is any one better than the other our Justin McElroy's latest bracket series aims to find out which reigns supreme we'll get his take on the online voting tournament next
Well, people in Metro Vancouver love their neighborhoods, and some might be tempted to say theirs is the best. But when it comes down to it, which community really reigns supreme? Well, that's where Municipal Affairs' Justin McElroy comes in. His latest project is called The Search for Metro Vancouver's Best Neighborhood. Uh, he's looking at what makes our neighborhoods special and how they've evolved over time. Uh, so first of all, Justin, why are we doing this? <laughs> well, Mike, you might remember this is becoming a bit of a summer tradition for us. Two years ago, we did a bracket competition to find Vancouver's unofficial ambassador, where Canuck the Crow won. Last year, we did a competition to find Vancouver's most iconic building, in which we crowned Science World. And so this year, we decided to stretch it out a little bit bigger, look at all the neighborhoods in Metro Vancouver, from Horseshoe Bay in West Vancouver, all the way to the township of Langley's Alder Grove. Over the next six weeks, we'll have a number of votes to see what people in Metro Vancouver Vancouver think is the most special neighborhood in the region. Okay, so people can vote. Uh, how does it actually work though? Yeah, so we will be having four sort of quadrants of 48 neighborhoods for four different sections of the region. And we're showing you right now the Vancouver one. So once a week, there will be one day worth of voting for each different region in Metro Vancouver. People will have a series of one-on-one -on -one matchups if they go to cbc.ca slash bc to vote. And we'll go from 42 to 48 to 32 to 16 to 8, eventually having a finalist for each of the four regions, then a final four. And at the very end of that, we will have our grand champion. Okay, so early days, but have we seen any uh, interesting results yet? Yeah, so today is the round of 48 for the city of Vancouver. So seeing already some interesting results come in. We have the Battle of Kitsilanos in one bracket, and we have North Kitsilano with about 70% of the vote over South Kitsilano right now. So it will go on to the next round where it's going to be facing Dunbar. Uh, and then uh, behind me here, I'm in uh, South Falls Creek. It is defeating the neighborhood of Crosstown right now. It's going to go on to face Yale Town in the next round, though. Certainly a popular neighborhood. We'll be hard pressed there, but a lot of fun matchups, a lot of fun debates, hopefully to be have over the next few weeks as we have these arguments. Well, we'll certainly look forward to it. All right, Justin, uh, thanks for, I know you're having some fun with it on uh, social media as well. So thanks a lot, Justin McElroy reporting <laughs> for us tonight. I think Justin is having the most fun on Twitter with this. Oh, he loves it. <laughs> he he's loves having, it. He's engaging people with his, uh, in his own unique way. Yes, he is. Are you partial to any neighborhood? Can I ask um, that? Well, isn't everybody partial to their own, right? You That's know, true. I have to. Uh, I'm partial to where I grew up. So I grew up in Southeast Van, so. Right. And Chinatown. Well, you're not allowed to vote. You have to recuse yourself. That's right. I'm, I'm impartial. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Zara is here at uh, 11 right after the National. Good night.